Oh my God, this is your tea that I'm drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I am so no, sorry. It's fine. Don't worry. Oh no, do you not want to drink it because I am uh, no, getting I over? Don't mind. This is Linda K. Klein. <laughs> She's the author of Pure, Inside the Evangelical Movement that Shamed a Generation of Young Women and How I Broke Free. Beginning in 2013 with her TEDx talk, Linda has risen to prominence as a leader who has spoken out about the negative consequences of the evangelical purity movement. My very first exposure to purity culture was actually before I even joined the church. It was pretty soon after my born-again experience. I went on a church retreat with a youth group. And later that youth group became my youth group, but this was my very first retreat with them. And I loved it, right? It was all of these people who were talking about life in a completely different way than then people talked about it in my junior high school where there was a hierarchy and certain people were rejected and other people were praised here in this youth group. The way that people seemed to treat one another was in this spirit of radical love. And I just had an overwhelming experience there. And I remember the bonfires and I remember the singing and I remember the lake. And I also remember at the very end of that retreat being pulled aside by a mother who was our cabin leader. She wanted all the other girls to go off during their free time and do whatever they wanted. She wanted me and a newfound girlfriend of mine to stay behind. And she sat us both down on a bunk bed and she said, you know, Linda, are you having a good time here with all these girls? And I said, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that's why you're holding me back. <laughs> like, yes, I'm having a good time. And she said, is everyone treating you well? And I said, oh yeah, everyone has been incredible. And she said, wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. And then she waited and she said, Piper, why do you have to raise your hand every time that the pastor asks a questions? Why do you have to always be the one with the answers? And she said, I don't think I do. And she said, yes, yes, you do. And do you think the boys like that? I can tell you right now that the boys do not like that. Boys don't like that. And going on and on, is it your insecurity? What is it about you that is making you demand to be seen? And I remember after that experience feeling like this cabin mom didn't quite get what was going on here, right? Like it seemed like this was a spirit of radical inclusivity and radical acceptance. And Piper and I went to the lake afterward and she utterly broke down in heaving tears. And the other girls and I hugged her and told her that the cabin mom was wrong and that there was nothing wrong with her and she wasn't insecure and wasn't self-centered and she just was really smart. But what I found as the years went on is that this first introduction to purity culture or to one piece of purity culture and its direct opposition to the spirit of radical inclusivity and radical love that I had fallen in love with was a tension that I would be faced with over and over and over again over the course of my time within the community. On the one hand, being told that we are loved without condition, and on the other hand, told these are the conditions. So that would be the first exposure. But I would say it didn't take very long after that for me to start being pulled aside and talked to about the length of my skirt or the fact that my talking to the boys was people called it flirtation, you know, whatever it was that day that they would say made me a stumbling block, literally a thing over which the boys and men would trip on their pathway to God. My name is Alex Lang, and you are listening to season two of my podcast, Restorative Faith. The goal of this series is to recast Christianity in a new light. If you're the type of person who questions and doubts, if you've strayed from the Christian faith because there's certain things that don't seem to add up, then this podcast is for you. Each season revolves around a specific theme that has caused people to walk away from the Christian faith. This season will focus on sexuality, and it should be noted that there will be sexual content discussed in all of these episodes that may not be appropriate for younger listeners. As a pastor, I can say unequivocally that the Christian perspective on sex and sexuality is causing people of all generations to abandon the church. Whether we're discussing the topic of premarital sex, 
marriage, divorce, adultery, rape, abortion, or homosexuality. There is a growing divide between the views espoused by the church and the perspective of the secular world. During this season, we'll be exploring this divide and the ways in which the Christian faith needs to change and adapt to speak to the sexual ethics of the 21st century. For our first episode, I want to spend some time delving into the traditional Christian perspective on sexuality. What exactly does that traditional perspective promote? Where does it come from? And most importantly, what has been the impact of these teachings on the young people who are learning them today? To begin exploring this in more depth, I want to return to our interview with Linda K. Klein. My mom had started to read the Bible well, she was pregnant with me. And she was getting really interested in this world. It was I was born in 1978. It's the year that Time Magazine called the year of the evangelical. The idea of evangelicalism and of being born again was it was really in the air. And a lot of my mom's friends were being born again. And so she had sort of this newfound interest in Christianity that she hadn't necessarily had before. And she had lost the baby before me. She had had a miscarriage. So she started to put a lot of her time into praying that this baby wouldn't be lost. And it was something that my mom hadn't really done before, prayed. And most importantly, what she felt in the months leading up to my birth was that she was heard, that there was someone on the other side of her call. And that was what was particularly unique. When I was being birthed, The story that she told is about how the doctor kept saying, more water, more water, more water. My mom, who is just this stick-thin woman, was absolutely huge. And when I was being born, we learned that so much of that was this watery world of protection around me that really reiterated for my mom this feeling that I had been chosen and protected because God loved her and because God loved me. Although Linda's mother had this intense religious experience at Linda's birth, their family was not associated with a specific evangelical church. For most of Linda's childhood, her family attended an Episcopalian church, a denomination of Christianity that tends to emphasize good works over right belief. But this all changed when Linda's family decided to move from California back to the Midwest. I don't generally talk about this, but my brother has cerebral palsy, and my brother and sister are both significantly older than me. They're over 10 years older, and in one case, over 12 years older. So I really kind of grew up as this only child slash baby of the family and was really adored and very happy. And then my mom got sick. She uh, has multiple sclerosis. And when my mom got sick, everything changed very dramatically. I was in fifth grade and wasn't appropriately understanding my my mom's health problems and wasn't dealing with it the way that I needed to. And I dealt with my mom's illness by absolutely throwing myself into school life. I was a straight-A student. I was in the choir. I was in the plays. I was had the popular boyfriend. Like I was excelling. So the level of perfection that I think I was held to and perceived as was perhaps an important part to understand. So for me, this next chapter of my life that started when I was in seventh grade, in which my evangelicalism was my absolute and utter entire life, you know, I think it means something different knowing that evangelicalism was everything to me when you know how much I needed it and how much, in fact, my being born again and becoming incredibly church-oriented and sort of the epitome of the good girl restored my acceptance in my family. As we heard at the beginning of this episode, once Linda began attending the youth group at an evangelical church, she was immersed in what is known as purity culture. Although purity culture is complex and nuanced, at its core, the purity movement relies on a fundamental premise. God desires for humans to remain completely sexually pure until they are married. Practically, what this means is you must abstain from all forms of sexual thought and contact until you are within the confines of Christian marriage, at which time you are free to indulge your sexual appetite. If you've never been exposed to this kind of teaching, let me give you a sense of what it's like. 
I spoke with Reverend T.C. Anderson, a youth pastor and leader in reforming the way youth are taught in the Presbyterian Church. Like Linda K. Klein, T.C. grew up learning the teachings of purity culture. Here, he recounts the first lesson he remembers being taught about sex and sexuality in his youth group. Something interesting happened when we uh, did talk about sex. It was very much an abstinence-only, God wants you to not have sex until you're married kind of education. Um, But I vividly remember when we first talked about it because our youth pastor, who was a man, took all the guys into one room and he had some of the female leaders take all the girls into another room. And so we don't, I still to this day don't know what the girls talked about, but I do know what we talked about. He had us sit around a table and he told all of us to put our heads down. And so like we all put our heads down into our arms and then he's like, all right, now no shame for any of these questions. None of you know Raise your hand if you've ever had an erection. And so all of us, all of us are like, what's happening right now? So we're all kind of peeking over our arms to see who else is raising their hands and like slowly putting ours up if it seems like, yeah, that's a cool thing to have had yet. And he's like, okay, now raise your hand if you've ever looked at pornography. And we're all like, what are we doing in here? This was the whole time. It was all these questions. I don't remember any talk afterwards. There might have been, (laughs) but this part was so scarring that I don't remember anything else until we signed an abstinence pledge at the very end of the lesson. So at the very end of the lesson, he passes out these sheets. He has us sign them saying we will stay abstinent until we're married. Mind you, we're in middle school at this time. Like I'm a seventh grader deciding what a 25-year-old TC is going to be doing. (laughs) And then we took it home to show our parents, and our parents seemed very happy (laughs) about it. So that whole situation was so awkward for for me, and I have to assume all of my peers. I don't. We didn't talk about it for years because it was so weird. And some of them I don't think I've ever talked to about it. It was so awkward and so strange, and I hated that feeling. I never want my youth to feel that way. I never want to have them put in a situation where they feel so out of control and awkward and like just. So where exactly does this idea come from that Christians need to remain sexually abstinent until they are married? Well, buckle your seatbelt because it's going to be an interesting ride. The books of the Bible were composed over a period of about 800 years in an area of the world we refer to today as the Middle East. Much of what you read in the Bible is a reflection of those ancient Middle Eastern social and cultural expectations. As an example, marriages in the Middle East were the result of two families arranging the marriage between a son and daughter of a similar ethnicity, class, and social background. It's important to remember that at this time, women were considered the property of men. The value a woman brought to her marriage was her virginity. This is highlighted in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 through 30, where it states that the first time a man has sex with his wife, he should find evidence of her virginity. What exactly is this evidence, you might be asking? Put simply, blood. The assumption at this point in history because of their limited understanding of human biology, is that the first time a woman has sex, there should be tearing in her vaginal canal that will cause bleeding. Today, we know that not all women experience this type of tearing during their first intercourse, but at that time, it was an expectation. So what men were looking for from their brides on their wedding night was blood on their bedsheets. Although you might assume this is a vestige of a bygone era, In countries like Ethiopia, where a woman's virginity is still highly valued, the bride's family will literally hang the bedsheets in front of their house, displaying to their entire community that their daughter was sexually pure until her marriage. However, if there is no blood, then the consequences are quite dire. The scripture says that if there is no evidence of virginity, then the men of the community, quote, shall bring the young woman out to the entrance of her father's house, and the men of her town shall stone her to death." A woman's virginity was so important to her survival in the ancient world that there's a law in the same section of Deuteronomy 
that states if a man rapes a woman who is a virgin, then that man is required to pay a fine to her father and marry her. The reason he must marry her is because now she is ineligible for marriage. She is considered for all intents and purposes to be tainted goods. And because of this, the law explicitly states that the man is never allowed to divorce her. Now you might be asking yourself, well, what about the men? Are they required to remain virgins until they are married? And the answer is no. And that's because it's men who are responsible for writing these laws. For example, a man could sleep with a prostitute prior to becoming engaged to a woman, and he was still eligible for marriage. In fact, a man is allowed to sleep with a prostitute even after he is married. The only prohibition for men is that they were not allowed to sleep with another man's wife. That is considered adultery. The point being, even though these purity laws are found in the Bible, it doesn't mean that God made them up. These were cultural attitudes towards sexuality practiced by every people group in the ancient Middle East, not just the Jewish people. So how did we go from women needing to remain virgins and men being able to do practically whatever they want to Christians not being able to think a single sexual thought prior to marriage? To answer this question, we need to turn back to our old friend, Augustine of Hippo, who lived from 354 to 430 CE. You might remember us discussing Augustine in the first episode of season one. The reason we talked about him is because Augustine was a giant of the Christian faith. Most of what Christians believe today and how they interpret the Bible come from Augustine, including Christian attitudes towards sexuality. For more on this, we interviewed Dr. Gregory Sapp, professor of religious studies at Stetson University. And so for Augustine, the life of the Christian is one of continued growth to the point where you're working your entire life to overcome your weakness. And his final obstacle to overcome was his own sexual desires. I believe he enjoyed sex very much. He says in his confessions at one point, he put away his concubine of 15 years with whom he had had a son in order to be engaged to a young girl, actually, as it turns out, she was probably no more than 10 or 12 years old, for political reasons, to further his rising career. But he couldn't have sexual relations with her because she was too young, so he took another concubine. And Augustine knew that this was going to be a, an issue for him. Well, he was in a house, staying in a house with his good friend Olypius at one point. You can read this in Book 8 of the Confessions, where he did something that I don't recommend people do. He had some of the letters of Paul, didn't have a complete Bible, and just let it fall open and put his finger on a verse because he thought that would be God talking to him. And on that verse, it said, somewhere in Corinthians, putting away all desire, all lustful desires, and having a pure heart and that sort of thing. And for him, it just, it washed over him that he could do this. He could give up sex to become a Christian as he thought he needed to do. And it's interesting that Olypius had the same experience uh, with something else that he was dealing with. And Augustine at that point, at about the age of 29, committed to becoming a Christian. So for Augustine, being Christian is more than simply believing in Jesus. For Augustine, becoming a Christian means purifying yourself to the point of being completely lacking of any sexual desire. And we're not just talking about lustful thoughts. In Augustine's view, even the basic human desire to procreate is considered inherently sinful. He actually says that procreation is done today only because of lust, and it's only because of the fall. He does say this in the Confessions. He believes that originally God intended for procreation to be completely without emotion, without lust, without any kind of desire or arousement, that it should have been as mechanical as moving a piece of paper from one side of the desk to the other. In fact, this is interesting also. This is why Augustine argued in On the Good of Marriage that the primary good of marriage is procreation. That's not the only good. I mean, he did believe that companionship was important, but since the primary good of marriage was procreation, when a couple decides to engage in a sexual act without the intent of becoming pregnant, that's a sin for him, which is why the Catholic Church uh, has banned contraceptives for that reason. So, yeah, Augustine's own inability or his difficulty in overcoming his own sexual drives, I think, did affect his view of that in a way that that's kind of Greek in that the Greeks distinguished between the mind and the body. That's what we get asceticism from, with the mind controlling the body. And so since sex was tied to the body, at least since the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, for Augustine it was something that was not good. But the only good in it was to have children. 
What Dr. Sapp brings up at the end of his remarks is very important. Augustine borrows from the Greek philosophers Socrates and Plato. He believes in a spirit-mind-body hierarchy. The spirit is connected to God, which controls the mind, and the mind has the ability to control the body. Therefore, every sexual impulse and desire we feel is something that can be and should be controlled. Indeed, this becomes a moral imperative for every Christian. The more a person is able to control their sexual impulses, the greater moral purity they possess. Of course, because Augustine's writings are so widely read, his approach to sexuality becomes infused in Western Christian thought. So when we fast forward 1600 years to the emergence of the evangelical movement in America, which was in part a reaction to the free love movement of the 1960s, they end up drawing heavily on Augustine's theology. But the modern purity movement is more than a simple reboot of Augustine. Whereas Augustine believed that sex in marriage should be utilized for nothing more than procreation and should not be enjoyed under any circumstances, the modern purity movement took a different approach. After all of this expected sexual erasure and denial and self-imposed naivete upon marriage, you are suddenly supposed to become a sexual beast. As a man, the expectation is that you're going to be a virile, sex-hungry leader, not only in the house and in the church, but also in the bed. And as a woman, the expectation is that you are going to love it that you'll have multiple orgasms, that you'll have simultaneous orgasms, and not only that you'll be sexually available to your husband at all times, but that you're going to enjoy it. Maybe the simple way to put it is that you're going to be a lamb during the day and a tiger at night. But once you're married, you're supposed to maintain this sexless lamb likeness all day. And then when your husband comes home at night, you suddenly become the beast that he has unleashed with his virility. In Tim and Beverly LaHaye's book, The Act of Marriage, they actually talk about how couples are, quote unquote, supposed to have sex. One of the things that they talk about in the book is scenarios where married couples have come in to see Tim LaHaye and have said, listen, this isn't working out. We're not having this wild, hypersexual tiger nightlife. So what's going on? And in some cases, it's because of shame. And there's a particular scenario that I remember them writing about where a couple comes in and the response that Tim LaHaye gives to the wife is that the problem with their sex life is that the woman has not accepted God's design for their sexual lives. The problem is her shame. So she did a great job at being a lamb, but now she's not succeeding enough at being a tigress. As Linda alluded to, this unique cocktail of the need for sexual repression before marriage, in combination with the expectation of hypersexuality after marriage, is the perfect breeding ground for sexual dysfunction. And this dysfunction manifests itself in many different forms. One of those forms is the double standard applied to men in purity culture. It is assumed that all men have voracious sexual appetites and that God created women to quell that hunger. In this way, women are devalued and seen as objects that fulfill the sexual desires of men, while at the same time, men are taught to be mistrustful of women. A woman's sexuality can be used as a weapon against men. Because women possess this power over men, women are taught their virginity is their most highly prized possession from God that must be guarded at all costs. Women are encouraged to be diminutive, quiet, and submissive. They must allow the men around them to direct, guide, and ultimately assume control over her life. This highly imbalanced power dynamic often results in men being able to do whatever they want with very little consequence, while women have almost no means to protect themselves. Linda told us about one such story from her time in youth group. I had this moment where a bunch of us girls approached our youth pastor and said, we, we want to talk to him about youth group. And he said, okay, you can come to my home, which is already, in retrospect, such a suspect thing. So we went to his home, 
And he was sitting on the couch with his wife, and he said, what do you want to talk with me about? And we said, well, we just want to talk with you about youth group. We really feel like we're living on the surface spiritually, and we're actually like very deep, hungry, spiritual people. We want less pizza, more Bible studies. You know, we, we just like really, we wanted to like get into it, right? And I remember him standing up when we said that, standing up, walking over to his front door, opening his door, um, and saying, thank you all for coming today. So no response. When that youth pastor was candidating for the role, our head pastor had him present at a youth retreat and then asked us all to give feedback to the head pastor. You know, do you like him? Do you want him? So I pulled the pastor aside and said that I was very uncomfortable with him because I just was uncomfortable with him in general in a way that I couldn't name and because he had made fun of someone with cerebral palsy in a way that, as you can imagine, for me, with a brother with cerebral palsy, was very upsetting. I mean, the making fun was very similar to kind of like the Trump making fun, if you know how that happened. It was a very similar, similar dynamic. So the head pastor said, thank you, Linda. He has already said that he did that and shouldn't have. He's already apologized. Please sit back down, right? It was a very, he didn't say please sit back down, but what he meant was like, thank you, we hear you, you are dismissed. Whereas other girls who I know who are on that retreat also pulled aside, at least two others pulled aside the head pastor and said, we are uncomfortable with this person. We can't tell you why, but we just feel really uncomfortable with him. What we now know <laughs> is that my youth pastor was later convicted of child enticement with a 12-year-old girl in my youth group with the intent to have sexual contact, which he had previously done in two other evangelical institutions and been, had, after been caught and, and confessing in both institutions, had been quietly moved along. So at least three of us girls who had to work up that gumption within a system that said sit to us as girls and women. We had to work up all that energy and, and all that sort of like downward focused magnetism. We had to work past that and resist to stand up, to go to the head pastor and to say, I'm uncomfortable with this guy, to go to the youth pastor's home and say, I'm uncomfortable with this. And every time we were told to sit back down, with Linda and her peers being told to sit down again and again, I began to wonder, what exactly does a healthy youth group look like where the girls and boys are treated equally? How does one go about teaching sex education in a church without falling into the purity culture trap? As someone who is currently striving to create a culture of equality in his youth groups, I pose this question to T.C. Anderson. I know this is not what you typically hear from pastors, specifically youth pastors, because youth pastors tend to stay on the black and white, good, bad side of things. It's, it's so gray that we have to talk about it. In a relationship, there's so many different parts. There's an emotional part. There's a mental part. There's a physical part. And if you purposefully neuter any one of those parts, then your relationship is going to be built all cattywampus. It's going to start to be uneven. And so as you grow emotionally and mentally with someone, you also need to seriously consider growing physically with someone. When we take away sexuality from a relationship, we're taking away part of the relationship. I don't remember the exact study I read, but there it was an overwhelming majority of people who abstained until marriage based on biblical teachings from the church felt shame. They have these deep-seated guilts about sex. Even after they're married, they feel dirty. They feel like they've done something wrong, even though they're no longer quote-unquote sinning. And that's a problem. After our interview, TC sent me that study, which was a paper out of Loyola College in Maryland from 2007 entitled Spirituality, Religiosity, shame and guilt as predictors of sexual attitudes and experiences. In this paper, the authors discuss how Christians who are raised to believe that their sexual desires ought to be repressed are much more likely to feel shame associated with their sexuality. And just to be clear, the authors distinguish between shame and guilt. Guilt is when our conscience tells us that we've done something wrong. Shame, on the other hand, makes us feel condemned to our very core. 
It causes us to question our worth and our integrity. And sexual shame is particularly damaging in this way. Sexual shame is an emotional experience of unworthiness that clusters around events of the past. For Linda K. Klein, those past events were all of the teachings and judgments associated with the evangelical purity culture into which she was indoctrinated during her adolescence. As she explained to us, that shame was buried deep in her psyche to the point where she couldn't even escape those feelings of unworthiness when she decided to turn her back on evangelicalism. So when I decided to leave evangelicalism, I remember setting out to assess the ethics of the culture and determine for myself which were worth holding on to and which weren't. And purity culture was one that was almost obviously unhealthy once I allowed myself to actually look at it. So I remember going to my boyfriend and telling him that I had come to believe that it was okay for us to have sex outside of marriage. We were in our 20s at the time. We were in love. We'd been dating for years. And I remember that choosing to cross that uncrossable line, the line that would affirm my community's worst fears about me. I remember thinking, though, that choice was wise and healthy. And when I made that decision, I would now suddenly be free from all the sexual shame and the fear and the anxiety. I was letting go of it. I was making a healthy choice. But in reality, what ended up happening is as soon as I made that decision, all of that sexual shame and fear and anxiety got a lot worse because now I was actively triggering what I call the sex shame brain trap. So researchers refer to a brain trap as when two things kind of get trapped together in the brain. So there is an adage in neurobiology called Hebb's axiom that says, when neurons are fired together, they wire together. So for example, researchers found that when musicians play an instrument and they might use the same two fingers together playing that instrument over and over and over again, eventually the brain maps for those two fingers become fused. So if you move one finger, automatically you're gonna have the other finger move with it. And researchers talk about how this happens with concepts as well. Sex and violence can become connected, for example. And I believe that purity culture creates in people a sex shame brain trap. So that the moment that we engage in or even consider engaging in sexuality can trigger this shame reaction. And for me, shame started to be triggered all the time once I made that decision. Even things that had felt relatively safe up until that point was now utterly laced with threat because I was open to the possibility of doing the undoable. The thing that would potentially mean the end of my relationship with my community, to be sure, but if they were right, would mean the relationship with God would be over as well. So now all of this was happening in my body and it started to express itself in these almost PTSD-like ways. It started to have really bad nightmares. My anxiety got so great that my eczema would flare. And even if my boyfriend and I were just talking about another couple having sex, I might start scratching myself until I bled. I have all these memories of blood-stained <laughs> clothing and sheets because I was just filled with so much anxiety around sexuality all of a sudden. You know, my fears that had always been there were now so great that when my boyfriend and I would do something sexual, though we didn't have sex. But, you know, nonetheless, I was taking pregnancy tests because the fear was so great that something horrible was going to happen to me. The anxiety was so raw that even he, as we would sit with the pregnancy test between us, would catch himself sort of waiting to see what was going to be read on the test. And he'd be like, what's wrong with me? Like, how? Do, why am I wondering if this test might be positive? That's how overwhelming it was. And ultimately what that ended up leading me to do was to reach out to some of the girls I grew up with in my youth group and ask them if any of them were experiencing the kinds of things that I was experiencing and started to hear hear some of the same experiences whispered back to me. You know, people were also having almost paranoia-like levels of fear. I was not the only one taking pregnancy tests, though she wasn't having sex. You know, whereas mine came out in my eczema, 
Some people were having panic attacks. And that realization that I wasn't alone became the beginning of my healing journey. What ultimately went on to become 15 years of interviews with people who were raised all around the country in evangelical Christian churches. It was finding the others. It was telling my story over and over to them and hearing my story told back to me in their stories that helped me to begin to get a sense of what had happened to me and the research I was doing that slowly over time revealed that there had been a purity movement and that in fact I had been completely unbeknownst to me one of the first groups of adolescents to have grown up within it. In my mind, the root of this problem in the church is the belief that God has sanctified sex as a very special act that should only be performed under very specific conditions. If you wield your sexuality in a way that is deemed acceptable, God will consider you a good, moral person. However, if you wield your sexuality in a way that is unacceptable, if you fall outside the strict parameters of purity established by the church, then not only will God condemn you as being immoral, but your community will reject you as being tainted and unlovable. This begins in the Old Testament with the purity laws surrounding women's virginity, is amplified by Augustine when he claims that a Christian life is one free of all sexual desire and has been reinforced by the teachings of the modern evangelical purity movement. Whether it's 500 BCE, 400 CE, or 2020, Christians continue to make their own fears about human sexuality the linchpin of whether or not you are deserving of God's love. Morality is 100% how we control how a kid acts like we don't want our kid to be mouthy to us as parents we say hey you need to honor your father and mother it's right there in the bible start honoring and so it's how we want to shape them into adults into positive influences in our world we don't want to be little jerks running around and so when we throw in sexuality into that moral thing i think that more than anything shows our own selfishness because either we we were taught that it was something you don't have until you're married or we're taught that this is a very adult thing and you're not ready and so we teach our kids that too and a lot of that is truth there's a lot of truth behind i don't know if you're ready to make this kind of decision it's a, it's a heavy decision there's the innate fears of disease but there's the the deeper fear of pregnancy and ruining your life but I also think it's a fear of loss of innocence. They want their kids to be kids forever. You don't ever want to think of your children having sex. Just like kids don't ever want to think of their parents having sex, even though you know that they did because you exist as a child. But to me, it's, it's even deeper than pregnancy. Because if someone's on birth control and having sex, then we consider that quote-unquote safe sex. If someone's using a condom, we consider that safe sex. And yet... We don't say to our kids, you can have sex if you're on birth control. You can have sex if you use protection. We say, don't, you're not ready, don't do it. And so I think the fear that we as adults have is this deep laden fear of they're growing up and they're growing up too fast and I want to protect them from the world. And so instead of diving into that difficult conversation about how I don't know if you're ready. I don't know if I'm ready for you to be ready. Instead, we say, God said so. And when we say that, the conversation's over. Because we can say, this is a moral choice. God said no. So if you go against God, uh, that's a bad call. Don't do that. You're a bad person if you do this. That's how we've typically done it because that's so, so much easier. It's so much easier. Like when a kid keeps asking why, and you go, because I'm the parent. That's why. Conversation over. Do what I said. And the real tension of this for parents is that for the majority, the vast, vast majority of this child's life, you've known best. You really, truly have. You have known that they shouldn't touch the stove. You have known what is best for this kid. And this is kind of the point at 16, 17, 18, and beyond where they're growing up out of that. You will still know best for a lot of things because you've gone through things. You have experiential learning that they don't have. 
But their life is theirs. And so ultimately, their choices have to be theirs. And so you don't know what's best. You don't know who the best person they should marry is or the best job that they should have because those are their choices. This falls into that category too. In the end, if the church wants to make a new way forward to speak to the sexual ethics of the 21st century, we have to acknowledge that the Bible's view of sexuality is biased, backwards, and in many instances, simply wrong. We have to acknowledge that Augustine's addiction to sex influenced his theology and shouldn't influence us today. We have to acknowledge that the evangelical purity movement, however well-intentioned, has done more harm than good and should be abandoned by all churches. Moving forward, we need to agree that having sexual thoughts, feelings, and desires is not inherently wrong, nor does it make you a bad or immoral person. We have to agree that engaging in sexual behavior is a natural progression of human relationships rather than an act sanctified by God. Where this leads us is into uncharted territory. Human sexuality is complicated and nuanced. It will take us the next five episodes of this season to unravel all the areas where the church has fallen short and how we can navigate a new path forward. Together, we will endeavor to create a Christianity where people can be nurtured and loved, not for some lofty ideal of who they should be, but for who they are. A big thank you to Linda K. Klein for her very open and frank discussion with us about the trauma she endured as a result of her interactions with purity culture. If you want to learn more about her book or her movement, Breaking Free Together, visit lindakklein.com or keep listening after the credits. I want to thank Reverend T.C. Anderson for his work to reform the way youth are taught about morality in the church. Again, we want to thank Dr. Gregory Sapp for talking about the history of Augustine. His knowledge and scholarship have greatly enhanced this podcast. On September 19th of this year, Dr. Sapp passed away unexpectedly from unknown causes. He greatly touched the community of Stetson University, and my life was enriched by knowing him. During my time as a student at Stetson, I got to know Dr. Sapp without even taking a course with him. He was extremely intentional, making time for any student who wanted to meet with him, and he frequently made time for me, especially as I prepared to go to Princeton Theological Seminary where he was a student years before I was. His willingness to be interviewed by me after my graduation from Stetson speaks to his generosity and love for deep conversation. I'm so grateful to have known Dr. Sapp. He's greatly missed. Restorative Faith is a collaboration between myself and Alex Lang and our newest addition, reporter Laura Savage. The music in this episode was written by Iconics Music, DP Music, Audiocom, Toonlight, Goldie Shine, Michael Musco, and Emilio Marone. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit us at restorativefaith.org. Break Free Together uses story exchange to help people to release shame and to claim their whole selves. The reality is that I didn't break free alone and that I don't think I could have broken free alone. So Break Free Together is a response to the conversation that started, I think, with my book. If Pure sort of helps people to start to understand that others are out there and that others have broken free or are breaking free, Break Free Together helps us to get actively in conversation conversation with each other and into a larger community where we can actively heal together. Next time on Restorative Faith. At this point, my mother called my father and told him to come over. He got there. He had a van. We jumped in his van. It was him, me, and my mother. I didn't know she brought her gun with her. And had I not been there, she would have shot him. Repression is a defense mechanism. It is one of the most important ways that we manage anxiety. 
in my work, repression takes place in the memory so that we forget events, we forget incidents, we actively, consciously push them to the side and say, I can't deal with that right now. Abortion is mentioned in the context of a pagan Greco-Roman society in which infanticide is lawful. You can take a baby, have it born, throw it on a trash heap, and nobody's going to criminalize you in the Roman world of that day. 